Now that we're starting to think about moving beyond just lenses, mirrors, and prisms in optics, perhaps we may find that we also need some new ways of thinking about optical systems, both physically and mathematically. There are many ways we're used to thinking about optics. We have ray optics, we have imaging optics, we have Fourier optics, where we start to bring in the wave nature of light, and all the way at the other end we have full electromagnetic simulation of electromagnetic fields. In between these we have ideas of modes. We see modes in resonator modes, we see them in waveguide modes, and also to some extent in beams or different kinds of beams. But this part of optics is slightly less clear than the others. We want some kind of modal optics to give us the right way to describe optical systems. The optimal sets of functions, which might even have basic physical laws that apply only to them. And that give us the most economical way to describe systems, including the right number of the right functions. To do this properly, we need to move beyond the resonator and waveguide modes that we're used to, however and even beyond the ideas of beams that we like to think of. We are used to modes for resonators, such as a mass on a spring resonator or a standing wave resonator, and for propagating modes in waveguides. We like modes because they are economical. We can use a few mode amplitudes, not fields at every point, and we can often count modes meaningfully. Modes have very useful mathematical properties, for example, orthogonality and completeness. And we can give a definition of a mode. A mode is an eigenfunction of an eigenproblem describing a physical system. But when we look generally at communicating with waves, or scatterers or optical devices or nanostructures between some source and receiving volume, we need a different kind of mode that looks at these source or input spaces and receiving or output spaces. They are modes in two spaces, not one space. They are not the beams between the spaces. To set up the mathematics of this problem, we consider two spaces. First of all, a source or input volume or space. And this space can contain the possible source functions, and we'll write these using a Dirac notation for convenience, as I've shown here, for this function psi s, so representing some source. Similarly, we will have a receiving or output volume, vr, which will contain the possible wave functions, and again we will write those functions using a Dirac notation for convenience, here phi r. The sources in the input space give waves in the receiving space through some coupling operator, which we'll call GSR here. For free space, this would be based on a free space Green's function, such as a scalar monochromatic Green's function like this one here. And what a Green's function does is it gives the wave at some point RR in the receiving space that results from the point source at RS in the source space. Now, we want eigenproblems to get modes, but we need two eigenproblems because we have two different spaces. And these are not, therefore, just the usual eigenproblems of, say, a resonator in each volume. There is, however, a key mathematical trick we can use instead. With the coupling operator GSR between the spaces, for the source space, we can solve the eigenproblem for this different operator, the product of G dagger SR and GSR. The solutions to this eigenproblem give us an orthogonal set of source functions, so psi SJ, in this Hilbert space HS. Incidentally, the Hermitian adjoint of GSR as a matrix would be the complex conjugate of the transpose of GSR, and as a Green's function it's a complex conjugate with the source and receiver points interchanged. With the coupling operator GSR between the spaces, for the receiving space, we solve the different eigenproblem for the operator GSR, G dagger SR. So we've swapped them around in order here. So we solve that to get an orthogonal set of wave functions, phi RJ, that are in this other receiving Hilbert space HR. 
Note incidentally that these two problems have the same positive eigenvalues, the modulus squared of this number, Sg. Now, when we have solved these two problems, we find that if we operate on one of these source eigenfunctions, psi Sg, with the coupling operator, Gsr, we get Sg times the corresponding one of the receiving eigenfunctions, phi Rg. So the source eigenfunction generates the corresponding eigenfunction as the wave in the receiving space with this coupling amplitude, Sg. Therefore, we have established the communication mode pairs of functions. Note that by our definition of modes that we gave earlier on, each one of these two sets of functions, the source functions, psi Sg, and the received wave functions, phi Rg, is a set of modes. The modes in one space are paired with those in the other. In practice, we only have to solve one of the two eigenproblems. We can deduce the solutions to the other one from, for example, GSR operating on psi Sg gives us Sg times phi Rg. This mathematical process is actually the singular value decomposition of the operator GSR. For any linear operator we can think of, D, which we may think of as a matrix for convenience, at least as long as it is bounded, that is, it has a finite output for a finite input, we can perform the singular value decomposition. That is, we can write it in one of the following two equivalent forms. Here, as a product of operators, which again we can think of as matrices, and here involving the functions. These are exactly the same, by the way. U and V here are unitary operators, that is, power-conserving operators, if you like. D diagonal here is a diagonal operator with the elements S, M. And these are called the singular values. The Psi M are the columns of U, and the Phi M are the columns of V. Note that for the matrix elements of D, which we could call G, I, J, evaluated on any orthonormal basis sets we like, the sum of the modulus squared of these matrix elements is the same as the sum of the modulus squared of the singular values. And we can usefully write this as a sum rule S. This sum rule is important below for many reasons. It can be evaluated without solving the problem, and it gives a limit on the number and strength of connections. All of this may be simpler to understand if we construct some simple examples. So we imagine we have our source volume, our coupling operator, and our receiving volume, and we can see how this works first for a finite number of point sources and receivers. So for example, loudspeakers at positions RS1, RS2, RS3, and so on in the source volume, and microphones at positions RR1, RR2 and RR3 and so on in the receiving volume. Using the Green's function, we can construct the resulting matrix to represent GSR. So let's consider three sources and receivers. A set of source points, which we could think of as loudspeakers, a set of receiving points, which we could think of as microphones. There's some separation between them. Here we've chosen that as just five wavelengths, and the sources themselves and the receiving points are separated just by two wavelengths. For these source and receiving points, then we can simply use this Green's function to calculate all the matrix elements. It's straightforward. And that gives a matrix that looks like this, presuming unit wavelength for simplicity here. This contains all the coefficients coupling the source points to the corresponding receiving points. Note incidentally that the sum of the modulus squared of the matrix elements in this matrix is the relevant sum rule here, so we get a specific answer for that, a specific number. With this matrix, the orthogonal eigenvectors of G dagger G are these three vectors, and the corresponding eigenvectors of G G dagger are these three vectors. And in this symmetric problem, these happen to be the complex conjugates of the source vectors, though that is not generally the case. So, these solutions that we have here are essentially unique 
there is only one set of such orthogonal channels. The modes then are these complex drive and receive vectors, not the beam in between the sources and receivers. It's these vectors that are the solutions of the eigenproblems. These are the modes. The modulus squared of the singular values are the power coupling strengths in this problem. So these numbers here that we get from that eigenproblem. So we see, first of all, that the channels are not all equally strongly coupled. These numbers are somewhat different. Note, incidentally, that the sum of these power coupling strengths is the same number we got before by adding up the modulus squared of all of the matrix elements. So the coupling strengths of these channels use up the sum rule. How would we use a communications mode? Well, the idea is that a given source vector gives the relative amplitudes and phases to drive the three loudspeakers to drive a particular communications mode channel. So this vector of relative complex amplitudes here. And a given receiving vector gives the relative amplitudes and phases for adding up the signals from the microphones to receive a given communications mode channel. So we add up the microphone outputs with these complex amplitudes. This would give us the first channel in both cases here. Optics, of course, does not easily have directly controlled point sources and receivers, but recent work with meshes of Mach Zender interferometers allows us to construct arbitrary vectors of superimposed amplitudes from separate sources. So we can construct these vectors we've been talking about also in optics. What this source mesh can do is it can take an individual input channel and construct an arbitrary vector of output amplitudes, here just shown as light emerging directly from waveguides. And similarly, this second input here can construct another orthogonal vector of amplitudes that come out here, and so on for the third one. So this can generate our point sources, as it were, from an individual channel, and we can have three different orthogonal such vectors of outputs here. Similarly, this receiving mesh can take vectors of inputs and it can sort them out one by one to these output channels. We can continue to look at larger problems with more source and receiver points. In this paper, there is a variety of examples, including ones with larger numbers of points and with one-dimensional, two-dimensional and three-dimensional source and receiver volumes. Here we have two vertical lines of sources, but very close together, but this is for a technical reason to eliminate backward waves for graphic clarity. This line of sources is over here. And we have a single line of receivers. The line of receivers is over here. But now we have 97 of each of these. The dimensions here mean we are approximately paraxial. The picture we are showing here shows the cross-section of the intensity in the plane. Here, for what is actually the most strongly coupled communications mode in this system. So let's look at a set of these modes, one after the other. I'm going to show you all of the odd modes in this system. So here's the most strongly coupled one. And on the right, we're showing the magnitudes of the power coupling strength, so the modulus squared of the singular values, as a percentage of the sum rule. So this first one takes over just 8% of the sum rule. The next one, mode 3, also takes a rather similar fraction of the sum rule. The next one, similarly, mode 7, mode 9. And by mode 11, we're just starting to see that the wave is missing the receivers. So here, the wave is just about to begin to miss the receivers, and we see a slight fall off in the strength of the coupling. There are more modes here. Here's mode 13, and we see this phenomenon of the wave missing the receivers getting stronger. And if we go to mode 15, we see the coupling is very weak, and we can look at that on a logarithmic scale as well. It does exist, but we see it's mostly, on this figure here, missing the receivers. It's not totally missing the receivers. There's still a very small amplitude in the middle here that we can't see on this scale. And if we go up to higher modes, we see the coupling strength falling off exponentially fast. This paraxial problem then does show a number of strongly coupled modes. 
that are all approximately equally strongly coupled, and up to what we could call a paraxial heuristic number, NHY here. It's about 12 in this case. This paraxial heuristic number corresponds to our usual ideas of a diffraction limit, by the way. And we can call this approximate equality of the coupling strengths paraxial degeneracy. Note that this communications mode approach allows us to count the number of usable channels for communicating with optics. The results here are quite definite and communications modes are unique. Once we have chosen the optical system, we have the answer to what are all the orthogonal channels for communication. Other than for accidental degeneracies, we get no more choice as to the orthogonal channels. We cannot create any additional orthogonal channels that are more strongly coupled than these. It's quite straightforward to extend this discussion to two-dimensional surfaces, and I won't go through the detail here, but we can state the result. It's quite simple. It's the product of the two areas divided by the square of the separation and divided by the square of the wavelength. Now, we should make some comment here about orbital angular momentum beams, because there's been a lot of confusion about this topic. The conclusions we have come to here about the numbers of channels available for communicating are not changed if we add in the idea of orbital angular momentum beams or modes. Orbital angular momentum is not an additional degree of freedom in optics beyond the existing spatial degrees of freedom. For usual optical systems, we can get just as many orthogonal channels using beams with no angular momentum at all. And the proof of that is given here. Note, in general, this communications mode approach is not restricted to paraxial problems. It can handle near-field problems as well, including the full electromagnetics. Non-paraxial and near-field problems still show communications modes and obey some rules on the limited number of channels. The main difference is that in such problems, the channels are not, in general, equally well coupled. In conclusion, this reference here contains a full introduction to this method and its results, including functional analysis mathematics that we need for some of the finer points here, radio frequency, acoustic and optical examples, several new heuristic behaviours beyond the paraxial degeneracy that I've shown you, for example, full electromagnetic and even quantum extensions, and even some new fundamental physical results.